Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of I Need to Tell You About. It's been a little while since I, I did one of these, but uh, I, I, it, it's something I said I was just going to do whenever I felt like it. This is, there is no set schedule with this show. Um, and uh, I, I am joined by a different guest today. Hello. It's me, <laughs> Mackle. Welcome aboard, Mackle. How's it going? So, uh, last time we talked about, you know, sort of an obscure, uh, surrealist comedy. A minor cult classic that's actually decently well known. And, uh, finally, a absolutely batshit religious documentary so today we've got something totally different it's uh an obscure surrealist comedy a minor cult classic that's moderately well known and a batshit religious documentary again <laughs> i promise that will not be the entire format of this show but <laughs> just, just these first two episodes i i, I wanted to talk about movies that fell into those categories incidentally so, um, welcome to I Need to Tell You About, the show where I tell you about movies, about weird, obscure movies. And, uh, to start us off today, I would like to talk about a little film, ooh, a little film from 2019 called Jesus Shows You the Way to the Highway. Um, this is, it, <laughs> it's hard to really pin down where this is from. It's, like, mostly a Spanish production, but it's one of those uh, indie films that went to, like, a thousand different distributors. There's, like, three minutes of opening logos before this movie. <laughs> because they had to get money from a lot of places. Uh, broadly, the, the film is about uh, this CIA agent, Agent Gagano, who has to go in to the virtual reality world stylized in the movie by having characters wear like sort of stop motion looking masks while they talk uh and although at some point he gets killed in the uh virtual world by his partner and at that point the virtual world just starts to look like the normal world to him uh because his his physical body is dead but he is still alive within the the virtual world, and he, he has to find his way back to the real world. Um, of course, sort of at the risk of spoiling this, uh, near the end, he he runs into a man who thinks he is Jesus, who thinks the, the, the man thinks himself is Jesus, and uh, upon seeing Gagano remembers that, hey, wait a minute... We were part of this uh, MIT drug experiment. That's what's going on here. So all this culminates in this, like, very culty, very Jonestown type. <clears throat> oh, everyone, like, take this, like, lethal substance. It'll free your mind from, like, this fake world. But, uh, you know, and then they wake up back at MIT. <laughs> It's a very interesting film. Uh, mm -hmm. I did actually show Michael this one. I, I waited to do this episode until I had shown Michael the movie. <laughs> so, Michael, uh, why don't you tell me what you thought of it? How you liked this movie? I, I did enjoy it. I was definitely drawn into how weird it was more so than how much I was laughing. Um, in terms of, like, good comedy, the... It, it's not that uh, I didn't find it funny, but the only thing that I think that was, like, actively making me, like, actually laugh, like, out loud was the villain, the Batman villain. Um, and that's partially just... One, it's just such a ridiculous concept, but also the guy's voice was just really funny. He just had, like, a really yeah, yeah. deep voice. He, They gave him funny things to say. He was, he was definitely my favorite part of the movie. But everything else about the movie is, like... It, it's, like, it's funny, but it's not something that's, like, making me laugh out loud. Like, uh, something like Kung... It kind of reminds me of Kung Fury in a way. Where it's this weird action movie that's taken a lot of, like, like kind of taken a video game aesthetic in a lot of areas. Um, and it just has, like, really goofy characters and a story that you're supposed to be laughing at and not taking seriously. Although Kung Fury definitely made me laugh more than this. 
But I did, I was just so interested yeah. in so much of, like, how they went about this. Just the way that they present this virtual world was very bizarre with these paper cutouts that put the lips on them can move. But it's also kind of, like, stop motion. I don't know if they actually, like, did like, did this, like, picture by picture. Or they just filmed it normally, then played with the frames in post-production. I, I'm I'm sure, like, the, the mouths were actually, like, CG. Oh, I'm sure, yeah, yeah, no, that... I'm I'm sure about that too. But uh, they they do play with the frame rate a little to make it seem stop motiony. Yeah. Um and that was uh you know it's like put in a lot of effort into its presentation. Um for a presentation that at the end of the day like looks really silly, but it it works for what they're going for. I like that it's just different. I like that it's different without being really boring and pretentious because this movie does feel very self-aware and a lot of movies that just try to throw in weird shit like that are trying to act smarter than they are. This one is like deliberately trying to tell you that it's aware that it's not smart. <laughs> Again yeah, with the no, villain literally I, I, being a bootleg Batman. <laughs> yeah, I I think I think uh Kung Fury is a very apt comparison. It there is a lot of, like, visual similarity between this and Kung Fury. Mm. Not so much tonally, I suppose. Uh, Kung Fury is a lot more, like, openly absurd. Right. Where this one, there's, there's like, an element of surrealism to it. It feels like it's, it's trying to be, like, a, just, like, a parody of, like, the idea of a movie. Yeah. I think that they got, like... Some very unique looking people to play these characters too. Like the main character, oh, yeah. he's played by a guy. The best way I could describe him is he has a very similar condition to what Ricky Berwick has, and that's not me being an asshole. That's like that's genuinely. Uh, I th I think he, from the movie it looks like he might be able to walk, unless they faked that. I don't think Ricky Berwick can walk, but aside from that, they look like they have very similar conditions where like they're. Their head goes more into their chest. Their arms and legs are very skinny. Yes, I, I couldn't say that for sure, but it seems like he has the, the same... Uh, he has whatever Ricky Berwick has. Yeah. Right, they have very similar physiques. And he had a very... He, he was just kind of a fun character to follow around, both because he does, you know, like, he does look very different than most of your action movie heroes um or sci-fi or whatever we're going to consider i guess sci-fi would be the best one to best way to describe it sci-fi adventure um and uh, yeah just that like i like too is just finding like unique people to star in your movies um and i i think that he did a you know i think that he, he's kind of playing it very straight but he's saying all this ridiculous stuff very straight although i don't even know if he's even the one saying these lines um, uh, yeah, because it's I mean, dubbed it, over it is, very weirdly. It is, like, humorously dubbed, so... Yeah. Um, and it's, they weren't speaking a different language. If you read lips, they are speaking English, but... At least most of the time. There might be some scenes where they're not speaking English, but there's scenes where it's like, the lip sync is almost perfect. It's But it's just a little off, and then there's other scenes where it is, like ridiculously off where someone will say something and, th and then it will actually be set on screen three seconds later. Yes. I liked his uh, girlfriend too. I like that. I like how just like how much of a contrast there is between them. I, I always like seeing that, but you mainly only see that like that kind of pair up in like animation. Um, so it's kind of yeah. fun seeing that here. <laughs> I I think they're a very nice couple. I, yeah. I enjoy like uh, the, the lead and his wife. Yeah. Um, there's like... <laughs> She she gets a few like nude scenes mm -hmm. and it there's like a deliberate sort of absurdity to the framing of those scenes. Mm -hmm. Like it it always feels so, like like it feels like they're imitating other movies, but in in like a very tongue in cheek way. The original poster for this cause there, there's like a shot of like him looking up at her in the shower and it's it's just framed like ass him next to her yeah um and that was like the original poster for the movie apparently <laughs> it's like a like an artist rendition of that shot 
This is a movie I, I actually picked up based entirely on the cover, and I was not disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Um, this seems like it'd the, be an the, amazing movie to discover by accident, right? Yeah, no, this, <laughs> this is just a movie I sort of stumbled on. Granted, it was uh, Arrow Video put it out, and I, I like Arrow Video well enough, but I, I looked at the cover to this. They've, they've got a different one with, like, all these characters in pink. You got, like... You got Gagano, but you've also got, like, the weird Batman guy. And you've yeah. got Stalin in the background. There's, uh, like, hammers and sickles. And and just the title, Jesus Shows You the Way to the Highway, you're like, what? I, I gotta know, I gotta know what's in this movie. That's another like, way it's kind of like Kung Fury, is one of the main villains is just a real historical person. Um, yeah, I think I think well, that Kung Fury uh, kind of utilized Hitler better, a little bit better than this movie utilized Stalin. You know, I almost forget that he's in it uh, most of the time. But uh, the the thing with Stalin is, is like it's it's in it's only in the virtual world that he's Stalin, and there's like a moment that's sort of played as a twist, but it's also like kind of a joke. <laughs> where he like takes off the Stalin mask and then puts on like George H. W. Bush mask. <laughs> He's like, oh yeah, the president is also uh, Stalin. They're the same person. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, I enjoyed it. I had a fun time watching it. Um, not like I don't think it's one of the funnier things you've shown me. I think we've de I've definitely laughed harder at stuff in the past, but it's just like. It stood out enough. It stood out enough to where I was like, kind of like, I, I wasn't getting bored by any of it. By any of it, I kind of like his two, uh, like loyal, our main character. He has like two people who, like, I guess, like, I guess they're old like veterans, and they like kind of yeah. join forces with him for a bit, <laughs> and they just kind of randomly start like treating him like he's royalty, which was funny. Um, yeah, but it's kind of just like, yeah, it's just kind of an absurd movie where you're. Most of the fun I think you have from it is just by kind of, like, blindly accepting what's happening. <laughs> yeah, no, it it is a movie that probably almost plays better when you're high. Just because it's like, nah, mm. just go with it. Like, don't yeah. worry about it. <laughs> yeah, you should not be trying to fall. If you miss 30 minutes of the movie and pick it back up, you'll probably be just, like, you'll probably understand it just as much as the people who've been watching it the whole time. Yeah. Uh, in in a lot of ways, it does feel very psychedelic. This that, that's why I, I brought up the ending that it's like an MIT drug experiment. I don't think that like ruins the movie. Knowing that, it, in fact, it might actually help the movie because it's it kind of like okay, now now I know where all this is coming from. I, I'm, I'm okay. Um, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry. It, the whole film feels like. Like this is like one of those CIA drug experiments, like like some MK Ultra thing. Like this is what those people were saying. It's a comedic take on it, obviously. It's, yeah. it's very silly with it, but it's like, yeah, this is what like this is what happens when you d do a drug test, when you test out experimental psychedelic drugs. I I think it's okay to have a movie that's just weird for the sake of being weird. But I also will say that I think it, in this movie's case, I do think it helps the movie a bit. Because this whole fit film just kind of seems like a weird dream almost. Like different rules and different like characters are just being randomly thrown in and then suddenly all of the characters know who they are. Or like it's just like the, it, it feels like the logic of how this world works is changing as the movie goes on. And that's very similar to what a dream is like. So it kind of just feels like a weird dream. This whole movie feel like I I could believe that this was a dream that the director had. Yeah. And just decide. Have you ever like had a really weird dream and you're like, oh, this would make a fun movie? Uh, yeah. Never long enough. I, I it's never stuck with me long enough that I could form it into something coherent. But yeah, I definitely have had dreams where there's like little images I remember from them where it's like I can put this in something. Uh. I don't know that I have that much else to say about Jesus Shows You the Way to the Highway. Same. I, I, I will say, uh, the... The Arrow video release of this comes with the director Miguel Lanzo's uh, first film, or at least previous film, Crumbs, which stars the same actor. Uh, I haven't watched that. It seems 
a lot more grounded than Jesus shows you the way to the highway. It is not as, as strange and bizarre, but I am interested in seeing it just just because I really enjoyed this film. I want to see what else this director is capable of. Yeah, and it's kind of like um, this director might be more of like a hidden gem, you know? So it's worth checking it out just for that. Mm-hmm. Someone's going to watch his stuff, right? <laughs> Well, uh, moving on, we've got a film called Sorcerer. I can't actually tell you why it's called that. It doesn't feature a sorcerer. This is from 1977. Uh, This movie was directed by one Mr. William Friedkin, who previous to this made The French Connection, which which to date is one of two action movies to win Best Picture at the Oscars. Oh. It was the first action movie to ever win Best Picture at the Oscars, and probably rightfully so, because it sort of invented the modern idea of a car chase. Like, car chases had been done before in movies, but this movie shoots a car chase the way everyone films car chases now. Like, every uh-huh. movie since The French Connection has been doing car chases like The French Connection. <laughs> So, so he won Best Picture with one movie, and then right after that, he made The Exorcist, yeah. which at the time was the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. So, with that in mind, he, he made Best Picture winner, highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. This is his blank check movie, right? You make those two movies, you make French Connection and The Exorcist, and the studio's like, fine, man. Make whatever the hell you want. <laughs> Here's your blank check. And so- Sorcerer is a blank check movie. And I-, I love to see it. Nice. The movie... It-, it, o- it opens on this, like, weird mini plot of this guy, like... He, he gets framed for the murder of the brother of this mob boss... And it's weird how long they spend on this, because it really doesn't come back in the back half of the film. But uh, eventually he has to flee to South America. He finds himself in this little village. Meanwhile, there's this, like, forest fire going on, and they, for some reason, need dynamite to, like, help stop it. Uh, <laughs> they, they explain it in the movie... I'm not sure I could explain it to you now. In the movie, it sort of makes sense why they need this dynamite to fight the fire. But I uh, personally, I could not explain why they needed dynamite to put out a fire. But the, the dynamite has been sitting for too long and, like, the nitroglycerin's leaking out. So, like, if these boxes of dynamite get jostled too much, they are blowing up. So, and and they can't... They have to take it through the jungle in a car, right? If they take it in a helicopter, they're going to hit turbulence, and then the turbulence is going to blow up the the dynamite. So they have to take it through the jungle, but they have to be very careful taking it through the jungle, or it will blow up. And as it happens, uh, this uh, guy who's, who's had to flee to South America, uh, played by Roy Schneider... Uh, well, well known for starring in Jaws, at this point, uh, he has to drive. He he's he's like one of the people in the village who actually like knows how to drive. He's like a very talented driver. So he and these three other guys all have to take these four trucks across the jungle, uh, with this dynamite in them, and they even. They figure early on, like, <laughs> the four of them get together and then, like, confront the guy paying them. They're like, all right, we figure you probably only need three trucks worth of this. Which means you think one of us isn't gonna make it. Um, so, and then they sort of use that as leverage to get paid even more. <laughs> but that's that's the rest of the movie, is them driving these trucks through the jungle and trying not to jostle them too much to, to blow up. And man, it is a beautiful movie. Like, this has some of the best cinematography I've ever seen. Beautiful colors in this film. Uh, this this is like one of those movies you put on to make sure the color on your TV looks right. <laughs> I'll have to check because it out. Go ahead. 
It's just got some very beautiful shots. I was going to say, I haven't seen The French Connection yet, which I, I've heard about it for a long time. I know I need to watch that one. Exorcist, I think, is awesome. So I'll have to check this one out. I just, I, I pulled up, you know, as you're talking about these movies, I'm just pulling stuff off my computer. I even sent you a link. It's like, is there, like, is there any, like, behind-the-scenes stuff you want to talk about with this movie? Because this is, the like, one of the longest Wikipedia pages I've ever seen for a movie ever. There's 143 <laughs> references on it. Like, there was some problems with this. And I think a lot of them were, like, after the movie was released, like, legal issues from what I'm reading. But this is, like... It's, like, insane how much is listed on this page in regards to this movie, which makes sense with how much, like, you're, you're, the way you're describing it, it sounds like it's quite the, uh, quite the piece. Yeah, no, I, this is, like, a big, bold movie. Like, like I said, this is William Friedkin's blank check movie, and mm-hmm. I, I just love seeing a blank check movie no matter who's making it. It's it's nice to see it it's nice when like a director is so established they're allowed to just make whatever the fuck they want. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like it's that is like that is like absolutely a blessing. Like and it's like not a lot of directors get to do that, but Yeah, no, mo most most directors are limited either either they're st- stuck under a budget but they have they, they have the creative freedom but they're stuck under a budget or they get like money but they have to bend the whims of the studio yeah and so it's it's just nice to see when when someone gets because this is not a movie a studio would make no studio would just be like yeah this this seems like a good investment like, this was something William Friedkin made because he wanted to make it. Yeah, like... It, it is an uncompromising vision. Like, uh, Tarantino and Wes Anderson are two directors that strike me as they're allowed to do whatever the fuck they want. Yes. Um, Spielberg, I, I, I assume that he could do whatever he wants, but it almost feels <laughs> like there's always a studio breathing down his neck because he has, like, a brand. Uh... Yeah, studio as uh, Spielberg, I think, is someone who who has very much put himself in a box. He's like, this yeah. is like he he makes very commercial films. That's just yes. his style, right? Yes, I I feel like in a lot of ways, he he doesn't like he is making the movies he wants to make. It's just those movies always happen to be pretty commercial movies. And that's that's not a bad thing. He he does commercial movies better than a lot of people, I think. Yeah, I, agree. I, I enjoy Spielberg's commercial output. I agree. The the controversy you're referring to is that there's some like domestic rights issues that that popped up in 2012 that made it difficult to get the film released for a while. It is out on Blu-ray now. I have a Blu-ray of it, and it's a beautiful restoration. It seems like there was, like, a, a big fight between uh, Friedkin and, and the studio over getting this film re-released for uh, Blu-ray and DVD. Oh, apparently it's based on a novel? I did not know that. I didn't know it was based on a novel. <laughs> I am just learning that now. It's always really likely that a movie is based on a novel. I mean, yeah, that that just happens. Like, a lot of... A lot of movies are based on books that, like, and, like, people don't even know. A lot of directors, like, are more into the filmmaking side than the writing side, it feels. Not that they won't write at all, but... I don't I don't know if there's, like, a ton of directors that, like, do everything, you know? Which, I mean, that's not a bad thing, but... <laughs> you ever, you p- ever plan on showing this one as, like, a movie night, or... It's it not... could be a movie night pick. It's not even um... that long, it's only two hours. And I mean, it's like it, it's like kind of a slow movie, but there's a reason it's a slow movie. It's about people driving trucks very carefully across the jungle <laughs> so that they do not blow up. Slow is okay it's, as long as it's like I, interesting. Yeah, like like we talked about uh, in 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 Crank, where like. Oh, if if they slow down, that's a problem. Like, like the slow moments are tense because if it slows down too much, he's gonna die. This is almost the opposite. If it speeds up too much, he's gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So the the movie like there there's just like a built in suspense to the whole thing. I don't know that I have much else to say about this one. It was I uh I had gone out into the woods with some friends to do some shrooms and we're sorta of, as we're sorta of coming down we're like, alright, we're 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 gonna take a trip because we, we, we were out on this like preserve like mm-hmm. my friend's dad has like a cabin out there and then we just had like no service and we're like all right we're gonna drive out to the front gate just to like get a little bit of service you know text whoever we need to text and come back because uh i i think th- my friend actually needed to like call his dad there there was like a very specific reason he had to call his dad that day and as as we're driving out there, we have to, like, cross this like, kind of rickety bridge. And I'm like, oh, this is, like, Sorcerer. <laughs> and that was, like, w- one of the first, like, more coherent thoughts I had had. That was, like, like describing the plot of Sorcerer to my friends was, like, bringing me <laughs> back to the real world. <laughs> just just help ground me by talking about this movie. So uh, it, yeah. it's got a very special place in my heart for that. Hey, nice. And it's also just, like, a really good movie. It's a really good movie. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely. I definitely will check it out at some point. It sounds interesting. I think The Exorcist is the only other movie I've seen from this director, though. Yeah. Um, I've also seen To Live and Die in L.A., which was okay. I didn't love it, but it was it was okay. And, of course, French Connection. I've seen French Connection as well. French Connection's really good. I, I, I do like French Connection. I would recommend French Connection to you. Yeah, I'll watch it. I, I, that's what I hear about a lot, and it's probably for the same reasons that you're mentioning with it. Like, it kind of, like... It kind of changed the game a little bit. Yes. So, uh, our final film that I would like to talk about is a little film from 1974 titled The Burning Hell. Now, The Burning Hell much like the last film, has sort of a strange story behind it. The director of this film is a man named Ron Ormond. Ron Ormond was, uh, like a sort of... He he got his start doing, like, westerns and stuff, but eventually he fell into exploitation. Uh, he did a lot of, like, more violent, more sexually charged movies. But then, very late into his career... He converted to Christianity. He he found Jesus, um, and he he joined the church of this like somewhat famous uh, like evangelical pastor, uh, Estes Perkel, and he made two movies that were basically just Estes Perkel sermons set to visuals. And, uh, both of these movies are just exploitation films. Like, you can tell Ron Ormond has his history in violent exploitation, because these movies are, like, horribly fucked up. Now, the one I'm focusing on is The Burning Hell, which is, uh, Estes Perkle talks about how hell is real and how you're going to be sent to hell if you, you don't repent and how bad it is in hell. So you get, like, a lot of depictions of, like, people dying and going to hell and being tortured in this movie. Uh, the other one, in case you're curious, is a film called If Footmen Tire You, What Will Horses Do? Which is about Estes Perkel talking about communists taking over America. Equally absurd film, but uh, I've chosen today to focus on The Burning Hell just because it's a little more focused, I think. It's a little more direct with what it's doing. Um, and it's... It's it's Christian exploitation. Like, I, I fucking love it. <laughs> this is an exploitation film, right? It is violent, it is disturbing, but it has a Christian message. It's all set to this, like, evangelical pastor going off about how bad hell is. <laughs> I just love it. I, it. It feels like a very genuine piece of, like... I, like, so many Christian movies, I feel like... 
sort of softball it or sort of yeah they're, they're more focused on other things this is like no we we are taking like the fear-mongering inherent in American evangelicalism, and we are just displaying it as it is. <laughs> and it's it's really a sight to behold. It's it's a really funny, really entertaining movie. Because it, it feels like they don't... It feels like they don't know that they're doing exploitation. It feels like they <laughs> think they're doing something very, like... This is like a wholesome Christian movie, mm -hmm. you know, but it's, but it's also exactly the type of movie that Christians would like criticize for being evil and violent and disturbing. Right. And that, that contrast between like what it is conceptually and what it is in presentation is hilarious. <laughs> the, the, like honest to God, uh, I feel like just movies like that. Um, just like completely oblivious films can be some of the funnier ones. Like there's a lot of anti-drug yeah. movies in like the oh God. 70s or 80s that were really funny. Yeah, no, I, I love some of those old drug PSAs. Have you seen Reefer Madness? Uh, Reefer, that's what I was about to mention. I've seen parts of it. I haven't ever seen the whole thing. My dad likes that movie though because he thinks it's really funny. Um, yeah, <laughs> these kids smoke weed and start murdering each other. It's like, <laughs> hold up, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, it... <laughs> uh, I, I swear it's like, it, it's so beautiful too because it came at a time where you know it's sincere. I feel like if you see something like that today, like maybe doing research on who made it would help you find this out. But nowadays, of how much irony there is in entertainment being made, it would almost be hard to tell if they were being serious or not. If something like that was released today, you know? I mean, I feel like if something like that were released today, it'd be like a parody right. of stuff like Reefer Madness. Because it's like, oh, yeah. ha ha, the like, fear-mongering conservatives think smoking weed is going to turn you into a murderer. <laughs> Yeah, like a lot of a lot of like shows and movies will like kind of poke fun at that. I remember like uh, like r early like Rick and Morty, like the first season came with one one of those little like booklets, like old religious oh, booklets like, that the, you would see the, like the, for the like Chick Track. Yeah, like there's like the Good Morty basically, <laughs> and they had that like that that, that was really funny. Um, oh, I fucking love Chick Tracks. <laughs> <laughs> the the burning the burning hell almost runs as like. A chick track movie, because <laughs> I, I I loved those comics. It's it's always like people dying and going to hell, and like oh, there's all these like terrible subversive characters, and and like they're always supposed to be like the bad guy, but it's it's just really I I enjoyed seeing these overly horrible people in these comics. Uh, like, one of my favorites is one called Bad Bob, about this, like, biker who's just, like, the, the biggest piece of shit. And it's, like, a part where, like, someone talks to him about Jesus, and he, he's, like, swearing about how much he hates Jesus, and he's like, If I could, I'd go to heaven and kick God's ass. <laughs> I love this character. <laughs> I remember there was, like, that one comic that was being released about how evil Dungeons & Dragons is, which I'm sure it wasn't the only one, but then there was a film made about it. But to my understanding, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but the film that was made was self-aware, where the comic wasn't. Yeah, the, the film was sort of a, a humorous, tongue-in-cheek adaptation of the comic. Yeah, like, the person who made the comic, the movie, didn't agree with the comic, they just thought it was really funny. Yes. Although, uh... <laughs> If you do want a movie about uh, the dangers of Dungeons and Dragons, there's uh, a made-for-TV movie starring Tom Hanks of all people. Jeez. It's from it's it's from way before he was famous. It's called Mazes and Monsters. I kind of want to do that one for Hollow Victories. That's... Like, do pair pair that up with like the actual Dungeons and Dragons movie, uh, from like two thousand. Cause the new I I saw the new Dungeons and Dragons movie and it was like good enough that I'm like fuck I can't do this for Hollow Victory. 
this looks. But I want. I want to do the two thousands Dungeons and Dragons for Hollow Victories. <laughs> So this is a movie that genuinely tries to make the argument that uh, Dungeons and Dragons is evil. Mazes and Monsters, yes. That's so weird that Tom it's... Hanks is in it then. And I know that you're saying it's before he was like a well-established actor, but still, how fucking bizarre. It, it was based on this like real case of like a a kid who like I think committed suicide, and then after the suicide, their parents were like. Oh, it was that Dungeons and Dragons game. That's what it was. It's just... Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like, like, there's so many examples of that where, where, like, kids will do something bad and then it's like, Oh, it was this thing. And it's like, clearly it wasn't that thing. Like, it, this has nothing to do with the thing you are blaming. You're just, uh, like, the, the, the new scapegoat. The scapegoat of the week. Yeah. I definitely believe there's media out there that doesn't help someone in a bad position, but to blame the entire thing on that is stupid. In Dungeons and Dragons, that one feels like a really big stretch. (laughs) Like, GTA, whatever. I, I I don't agree that GTA is responsible for that, but I also... It makes more sense to point fingers at that than something like fucking Dungeons and Dragons, like... Which... Can be really light. I, I mean, that just depends on the group you're playing with, too. That could be a really lighthearted game. Yeah, it's yeah, a game I, I about imagination, like... for fuck's sake. I the 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 thing with Dungeons and Dragons is like, oh, it has magic. Oh, you you're like doing witchcraft and and making deals with like demons. It's like uh, not really. Yeah. I mean, you could you can write your character that way if you want to, but that's that's no different, I think, than just writing a short story about a character who sells their soul to Satan, right? Right. It's just as easily you could make a and d character who's, like, a good Christian boy. Because, <laughs> yeah, D- you know? D&D is, like, there's nothing established really i mean okay some games there are some games have like a world set up that you follow but i mean like a lot of people just like create everything from scratch really so it's like yeah you can't like (laughs) yeah i I think you summed it up perfectly it's like writing a short story like my my son my son killed himself because of a short story he wrote like it's just i don't know yeah but uh, it's it, yeah, it's a scapegoat. It's exactly what you're saying. It's like it's easy to point fingers at something else other than yourself. Or yeah, no. What's what's the the whipping boy of the week? Dungeons and Dragons, video games, fucking Beavis and Butthead, South Park, uh, the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's although you know the the internet. That's that one's a mixed bag because there are times where like something on the internet like actually does cause a problem for someone but just just as often it's like oh we want an easy thing to blame it was a creepy pasta on the internet told my son to do this yeah no it, it, it's kind of like like i said it, like i think in a lot of cases something doesn't help like if someone's genuinely going through a really really hard time and they're having really horrible thoughts and they spend all of their time playing video games where you shoot people I could see how the video games wouldn't be a good, a good thing. Like, it's not helping, you know? It's not, this isn't the solution to keep doing this. But it's also, like, yeah. then to blame everything on that, I, th- I think that's where you start to get a little silly. Because, uh, yeah. like, clearly there's a lot going on there. We've sort of drifted from the topic here. Yeah, it's because we're Just, talking about uh, exploitation, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and Christian fear-mongering. Fear-mongering in general. That, that is the core of, of the burning hell. It's like, if, if you don't repent, you're going to hell, and look how bad hell is. Yeah. But that, that to me, makes for a very interesting movie. I think there's, like, I, I, I will talk sometimes about, like, Catholic horror. There's, there are a lot of, like, really good Catholic horror movies. I mean, even earlier we were talking about The Exorcist. The Exorcist is a pretty Catholic movie at its core. Um, yeah, it is. And didn't it get protested? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's the weird thing. There were, like, 
Christian organizations that protested it for, like, depicting demonic possession. But at the same time, like, the author of the book The Exorcist is based on is, like, deeply Catholic. And he wrote this as, like, a... Like a cath, uh, like a very deliberate Catholic message to the to the book. Um, that's the the edges of that have kind of been sanded out in in the movie, but it's still there. It's still yeah. like like the hero of the movie is a priest who who exercises the demon in the name of Jesus. Yeah, and uh, there there were like just as many like Christian organizations who who praised the exorcist for 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 being as christian as it is uh the burning hell the burning hell is like not even just protestant horror it's it's american evangelical horror <laughs> my dad once told me a story about like it was a movie that got picketed um out in front of the theater um it was a, it was a, another religious theme movie and that movie was a little mo- movie called Money Python's the meaning uh, not the meaning of life the life of Brian life and of Brian. and like there's a bunch of people outside like the press came and they were interviewing like people just like who saw the movie and people who were picket in the uh movie I'm um, going to be fair that one unlike the exorcist is just flat out making fun of religion <laughs> but um <sighs> eh I I I don't <laughs> I think it's making fun of more of, like, the blind acceptance of religion. Sure. Over, like, religion in specific. Because, mm-hmm. like, Jesus is in the movie, but very briefly, and there's nothing in there about, like, like him being a bad dude or anything. Yeah, just... I don't think there's anything, like, super offensive about it. I, th- I think the film's biggest crime is just being really boring, in my opinion. <laughs> oh, I love that movie. I think it's funny. I love right, Meaning I think... of Life. I love Holy Grail. That one, I maybe I could re- give it a second chance one day, but the only part I liked was, like, the closing song. Meaning of Life I like a lot less than the other two, uh, just because... Like, it's it's such a mixed bag to me. Like, there are sketches that are really funny, and then there are sketches that I'm like, okay, no thanks. <laughs> the only one where I, like... I remember the only part of that movie where I tapped out was the puking scene. And it's not even because it grossed yeah, me w- out. It was just like, this isn't that funny. This is all the scene has. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you. It's gross. And it's like, is that it? It's just gross. Yeah. <laughs> it does lead into a funny scene of a person kind of like, like establishing what his meaning of life is. Um, and it's suppo- it's like, like the most sincere moment of the movie until he gets insecure about it. Um, that part's really funny. But that, like, that's almost like a new skit. Like, it's like that skit leads into that part. Um, the uh, thing that I was going to say about Life of Brian, though, is the funniest thing about that is my dad, like, he, he, he apparently didn't end up, he either didn't show up on TV or my grandma didn't see it because he said he got interviewed. And then immediately after, it was like, ah, oh, shit, I'm skipping school. I might get in trouble for this. <laughs> 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 But he said he never got in trouble, so either he they didn't use his footage, or uh, my grandma just didn't see it on the news. I don't know if Anyways. he saw the movie that day, or if he was just walking by where it happened, but yeah, he was a big Monty Python fan, though. The Burning Hell. Very funny movie. <laughs> I, I I mean, I, I, should, I should maybe give a little praise to uh, Ron Ormond, like... The, the like, exploitation elements of the film, they're pretty effective. Like, it is, it is, like, a scary movie. It probably shouldn't be. <laughs> and that, like, like, the, the amount of effort he has put into this versus, like, what the movie is kind of intended to be. It, that that's part of like the humor is just the disconnect between like how extreme what he made is and the fact that this is just supposed to be like a sermon that it's supposed to be like a wholesome Christian movie <laughs> to teach Christian values. Mm-hmm. It's it's a uh, Passion of the Christ before Passion of the Christ. Yeah, you know, I I watched that movie. It was so boring. <laughs> So that's the impression I got of it. Like, the only thing I ever really saw of Passion of the Christ was the South Park episode, but... 
Like, I, from what I saw, I think, if you ever saw that one, I think Stan and Kenny's reaction is the reaction I would have, because it sounds like it was just two hours of Jesus being tortured. It's not two hours of Jesus being tortured. It's, like, 20 minutes of Jesus being tortured and not much else. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, I, I, I was watching that and I'm like, people took their kids to see this? I would have hated this as a kid. Like, I would have been bored by so much of it and then, like... The violent parts probably would have made me feel bad. So, hmm. like, I would have gotten nothing from this movie as a kid. Religious media, like, it's... <laughs> Parents who show their kids religious media don't understand how much they're scaring their kids away from religion. Because <laughs> it is the most boring stuff ever made. There's exceptions, of course. But not a ton like, the two I always jump to yeah, is I'm... Veggie Tales and Prince of Egypt. Yeah, like, those are good. Um, most of the good Christian media I can even think of, like, is explicitly directed at adults. Like, uh, First Reformed is really good. Uh, and Silence, Martin Scorsese's Silence. Those are both, like, very religious movies that I think are really good. But, like, a kid's not gonna like them. <laughs> They're, they're yeah. like, very adult movies, I think. It's just a lot of... I don't know, like... There is probably more, like, good, like, kids Christian content where it's, like, it's good for, like, a five-year-old. I mean, yeah, no, there's definitely stuff that, like, okay, a little kid would enjoy this, but it's it's not gonna, like, hold up. Yeah. I, I mean, I... I, I the, the episode of McGee and Me I focused on, I think, does a really poor job delivering its message. But as a show, I think McGee and Me was, like, pretty innocent, pretty innocuous. Like, I think kids might enjoy it. What about, uh, what was that other show? With the fish. <laughs> Gaither's Gaith Pond. Yeah, Gaither's Pond. How was that one? <laughs> Ten out of ten? The music's good. Yeah. The music's great. But, uh... <laughs> No, I it, that that one like kind of creeped me out as a kid. It is creepy. Like, they're very uncanny valley. In particular, there there was like the this whole sequence. Uh, there's, there was this song called "The Rumor Mill," and they they have this like animation of the rumor mill, and it's it's just freaky. Like it creeps me out. <laughs> even even still, it's like I don't like this. Yeah. Anyways, uh, I think that should wrap us up. Nice. Um, Jesus shows you the way to the highway. Funny, weird ass, very original, very creative movie. Uh, sorcerer, incredibly suspenseful, brilliantly made, just an, a, a rare, uncompromised vision. And The Burning Hell, uh, a very funny movie that... Almost seems like it doesn't know what it is. <laughs> um, thank you for joining me, Michael. Of course. And uh, Thanks for having me. Thank you, uh, everyone at home, for uh, listening. Maybe there will be another episode of I Need to Tell You About. Maybe there will not. The, these When I did the first episode, I, I was already kind of set on doing the second one. I have no ideas for a third episode. Not that I couldn't come up with something. Like, I, I could just, like, dive into my, uh, like, letterboxed account, find some, like, super obscure movies that I really like to be like, oh, yeah, these, these would be great to talk about. But, uh, for now, I, I think this is good. If you ever want to do one where you have guests come on and talk about some movies, I, I've definitely got some. I, most of them are ones I think I've oh, shown absolutely. you, too. Uh, oh yeah, no, I'd 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 love to have an episode where you talked about some weird obscure stuff. Yeah, and I think I I think most of them are ones that you've seen too. I I think I, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> All right, so uh, maybe look forward to that. Yeah, it'll happen whenever I get around to it. I don't even know when this one's coming out because I I'm probably gonna drop this after I finish the uh, Power Hour video, but. I don't know when I'm going to finish the Power Hour video, because I have not been doing a good job on it so far. <laughs> I need... Here's the thing, I need to finish the Nicktoons Unite games, but uh, I haven't gotten around to that either. <laughs> do a stream tonight. Let's do it.
Uh, I got work tonight. But tomorrow, tomorrow I think I'm just gonna sit down and, like, knock out as much of, if not all of, Attack of the Toy Bots as I possibly can. Hell yeah. Anyways, maybe we'll see you in the next one. Yeah. Peace.